What's going on, everybody? My name is Tyler Glosscock, a.k.a. Tide Talk Sports, and welcome to my first episode of the Intern Podcast here from Natty State Sports. First of all, I'm so excited, so blessed to be in this position to be filming this. I'm really thankful that John, Curtis, Scotty, Andrew have really been teaching me a lot of stuff about this business and are giving me the opportunity to share my voice and what I'm passionate about, which is the NBA in today's episode. So I'm really excited to bring this content to you guys, and I'm just so thankful that I'm in this position to be doing this. Let's just get straight to it. There's a lot of stuff as the NBA regular season just closed out, and there is a lot of fun debates going on. First of all, we're going to get it kicked off with the first one. We got the MVP race. This is arguably the closest MVP race in quite some time. It could go to any one of these three candidates. We got Nikola Jokic, Luka Doncic, and Shea Gilgis Alexander. Three dudes who are just playing flat out dominant basketball and leading their teams to wins. And hopefully they'll lead them to big postseason runs. But we will see what happens between these three. My guy, my pick, my 2023 2024 MVP has got to go to Luka. Doncic. This guy has been on another level of basketball lately, averaging 34 points per game, nine rebounds per game, and 10 assists to close out the season on 48.6% from the floor and 38% from three. He's taken Dallas to another stratosphere in these past few months. Now, here's the thing. Between these three, I will not be disappointed if Nikola Jokic wins this MVP. He deserves it. I don't think Shea deserves it as much, but if he wins it, he obviously has a case for it. All three of these guys do. But I think it's Luka, Jokic, Shea in, in that order. Shea has, is leading the best team in the Western Conference record-wise, but they also have a very, very, very well-rounded team with so many young stars around them. Chet Holmgren, uh, Jay Dub from Santa Clara, Jalen Williams from Arkansas, Isaiah Joe. I mean, the Pro Hogs are balling. Josh Giddy. There is so many amazing pieces on that team. And I think when you look at overall impact on a team, Luka Doncic and Nikola Jokic, I think, are more impactful than what Shea brings to the Thunder because they have guys who can take over when he steps out. The argument for Dallas throughout the course of the season is that they were struggling to get wins early. Before the deadline, they were 29-23, and 23, and now they finish the season at 50-32. and 32. So they went on a really big stretch. And throughout the most of the month of March and for previous, se- for previous months, they were sitting around 7th to ninth in the Western Conference, which pushed them in the play-in tournament. But Luka Doncic elevated his play down the stretch and was able to lead Dallas to a fifth seed against the Los Angeles Clippers, which will tip off this weekend in L.A. During the month of March and April, they only lost seven games, the Mavericks. And Luka didn't play in three of those. They lost two games to close out the season because they rested all their starters. They knew they had locked up the fifth seed, and they lost to OKC in early March, and Luka didn't play that game either. They opened the month on a three-game losing streak to Boston, Philly, and Indiana, and they were struggling. They were struggling throughout the first half of the season before the deadline, and then they started making some rolls, some, some moves, and then what really stepped up was the elevated play of Doncic and Irving coexisting efficiently from another perspective because they played well to start the season. They were playing great, but both of them just took it up another level, especially in the month of March. Luka averaged 32.5 points, 10 rebounds, 10 assists. Kyrie averaged 30, uh, 24, 4.6 rebounds, and 5.5 and assists per game. And they were averaging the highest amount of points per game by teammates since the NBA-ABA merger, around 59-60 points per game. As I said, they were merely at 500, just six games above. And now... They are 50 and 32, and we all know what Luka Doncic does when he faces the Clippers. We've seen how he takes it to another stratosphere with his play and takes it personally against them. I don't know if they talk bad about his mama or he has just a personal beef with L.A., but he steps up his game when he plays the Clippers, averaging 32.6 points per game, 8.3 rebounds per game, and 7.4 assists per game. Now, like I said, you can make the case that Nikola Jokic should win his third MVP in in four years. And honestly, he really should have won it last year. Both him and Shea have their cases. But 
an overall impact to a team, as I said, it's got to go to Jokic. Or not Jokic, sorry, Doncic. I, I was just reading here and I saw Jokic. The MVP is no longer about who the most valuable player is to a team. It's more of so who is the best player on the best team. And if we're going to go with that, then it should definitely be Shea or Jokic. Either one of those two. End of story. But when you look at overall actual value to a team and the way that Luka Doncic has elevated his entire roster, it has to go to him. It really does. He has genuinely made his team and other players better. Daniel Gafford, P.J. Washington, Kyrie Irving, uh, Derek Lively Jr., I mean, there is so many guys who are playing better when Luka Doncic shares the floor with them because of the overall distribution and game plan that comes when teams have to face Luka Doncic. Luka Doncic is the game plan. He is stop Luka, make someone else do the scoring, make someone else beat us. That doesn't matter to him. At any given moment, he could go drop 50 points on 10 three-pointers and literally drop the most diabolical horse shot you could ever think of. That one against the Rockets, where he literally from was by, almost at the three-point line and throws it up underhand and drains it. We haven't seen someone with this type of dominance, I think, really since the 2015-16 year where Stephen Curry was given the unanimous MVP. That's how I feel when I watch Luka Doncic because you know at any given night this dude could torch you and you're going to consider your life choices watching Luka cook against your favorite team. I've done it multiple times this season. I'm a diehard Spurs fan, and that first game in the season – where Victor Wembanyama made his debut, Luka Doncic drained a wild step back three down the stretch to give them the win. And I couldn't even be mad about it because that's the type of player that Luka Doncic is. You hate to play him, but love to watch him. They knew that going into the trade deadline, they had to make moves. They knew that they couldn't get it done with this supporting cast because only Luka could only take them so far. So that's when they go and get P.J. Washington, and then they go and get really the first proven center in Doncic's career in Daniel Gafford, and you see the way that this really impacted it. It finally added a stronger uh, pick-and-roll presence, more lobs, because that was missing. They had Dwight Powell and Maxi Kleber who are still on the roster, but those were not true proven centers who had great verticality, who were great defenders. And that's what Daniel Gafford is. And yes, they drafted Derek Lively in this year's draft, and then they just finally added depth. That was missing. They, I can't remember how long it was since they had a true dominant center. I guess Kristaps Porzingis was really the last proven guy, but he was coming off an ACL injury, and he wasn't. He has never been the same. He was not working with Luka, and they traded him for Spencer Dinwiddie. And Spencer Dinwiddie and the Luka comparison, that worked. That pairing worked so much more just because there was something off about Porzingis. He's never been the same. He's been doing great in Boston, but the pairing of Luka and Porzingis didn't work because Luka still needed to be the dominant star, and that's what he is. He still is the guy who's controlling the ball, who's controlling the game, who has the ball in his hands. Yes, you have Kyrie Irving who can take over when needed. You have Kyrie who you can rely down the stretch. This is a guy who's literally hit game winners in the NBA Finals. They needed a veteran who could coexist alongside Doncic without taking a lot of, of, of shots, without a lot of touches. And that's what this is. You can break the two up. You start them together, they'll dominate, and then you break them up and then go from there and have them close down the stretch. But the biggest successor in really elevating the Mavericks this season was just making moves at the deadline that benefited Doncic. When you do your best to build around Doncic and benefit him, that's what is going to take you farther. And that's what they've done in the month of March and April. That's what they've done. They've been able to play so much better consistent basketball because of how well-rounded this roster's gotten. They traded away Grant Williams, Seth Curry, and got P.J. Washington and Daniel Gafford. I can't remember what they sent in that Gafford package, but they knew that they had their superstar on their hands, and they knew that they had to go all in, which brings me to my next point. Give the alien Victor Wembanyama some help for the love of all things holy. 
It is frustrating to watch as a Spurs fan. I enjoyed this season. I enjoyed watching Victor Wembanyama on any given night because anytime he took the floor, he could do something where you say, I've never seen that before. And there were so many times where I said that. They have their superstar. They need to take notes of what Dallas did and start working on it. When you look at what the Mavericks did, Luka's best teammate through his first three, three, three four years was Jalen Brunson. And that was before he became Jalen Brunson, the guy who could drop 61 points, uh, and the guy who could go get 30, elite footwork, elite score, the guy who he is now. After his departure, the Mavs were really in the dust, so then they got Kyrie. They did. And as I mentioned earlier, they got Gafford and P.J. Washington. They knew they had their star in Luka and knew that this roster wasn't competent enough to compete alongside him. So then they went all in. You get Irving. You get Gafford. You get Washington. Now, another team in Texas has to do this. They do. They really need to take note of Dallas and start working on it now. Like I said, Victor has lived up to the generational label. He hasn't even, he just completed his rookie season And he finished with 21.4 points per game, 10.6 rebounds per game, 3.9 assists, and 3.6 blocks. Now, it's no difficult decision that he's going to be named Rookie of the Year. But what are the chances he's considered for Defensive Player of the Year? I know Rudy Gobert is the favorite right now, and it's not close. He's the best defender on the best defensive team. And that's okay. If Rudy Gobert wins this award, I won't be shocked. It'll be his fourth in his career, and he's arguably one of the best defenders of all time, one of the best rim protectors. So I'm not going to be upset if Rudy Gobert gets this award. But when you look at overall defensive impact, you have to look at what Victor Wembanyama has done since his arrival to the Spurs. Last year, before they drafted him, the Spurs were the worst defensive team in NBA history with a rating of 120. That just got exceeded by Utah, who was sitting at 120.4, so it's not close. Last year's San Antonio team can still be considered arguably the worst defensive team of all time. And I watched every game of that, and it was frustrating to watch. When they drafted Wimbanyama, they knew what they were getting in him. You had a guy who was a unicorn, an alien, one of one, a guy who could could, could, could just cross over behind the back spin move at seven foot five and then block 10 shots, which is what he's done. He completely reinvented the landscape of San Antonio's defensive identity. He has 22 games, I think, that's the final number, with five blocks or more, three games with eight blocks or more, and he also had a 10-block game against the Raptors in February, which was able to give him his first triple, his second triple-double of the season, but first triple-double with blocks, and I don't think that'll be the last one that we see. It's not just his... His, his morale-crushing rejections that make him qualified for Defensive Player of the Year honors. He also averaged 1.2 steals per game, and he also led the league in stocks. Steals and blocks per game with 4.8. That is a really um, up-and-coming stat these last few years, but it's really v- vital. When you look at overall defensive impact, you have to look at what they're going to do, not just under the rim, but on the perimeter. Victor does that. You really do. You can take the numbers out all you want. I mean, but it's just the way that Victor impacts the floor, not just in the stat sheet, but in his length, in his separation, the amount of floor he covers. Sometimes I've never seen a a player have so much defensive impact that when a team has a three-on-one fast break, they can't decide who wants to challenge him because they know he's going to be ready to stuff it. I've never seen that before. There are plenty of teams who make business decisions to not challenge Wimbanyama, knowing there's about a, a, an 80% chance that it's going to get blocked. The other night against Denver, guys were screaming from the bench, look out, he's behind you. I, I can't remember a player who had that type of impact ever. I've never seen that before. I've never heard of teams saying, screaming, look out, he's behind you. When you look at the comparison of Wimbenyama versus Gobert, these are the these are the two favorites. Victor averaged 3.6 blocks per game. Gobert averaged 2.1. Wim, 
Victor had 8.4 defensive rebounds. Gobert had 9.1. 1.2 steals per game for Wimbenyama. 0.6 steals per game for Gobert. 3.0 deflections for Vic. 1.6 for Gobert. And then here's the biggest differential. There it negative 12 difference in defensive rating when he's off the court for Victor. And then a negative 4.1 defensive rating difference when versus when Gobert is off the court. These dudes have genuinely reshaped defense for their teams. The impact that these guys make is insane. Because when you have teams, when you have guys who, who completely change the defensive scheme, it's going to be a great debate. It's always a great debate. I mean, out, and, like, and then outside of the defensive rebounds, Victor outdoes Gobert in all these categories. And then back to the defensive rating difference, when Victor is off the floor, the Spurs rank 28th in defensive efficiency. And when he's on the floor, they're fourth. Top four in the league. That is a massive gap. An absolutely massive gap. And it doesn't matter, though. At the end of the day, if it goes to Gobert, I can't be upset. This is one of the best defenders in the entire association. That's what he's known for. He's respected. He's one of those guys that both, I mean, both of them are, but one of these guys that if you make a highlight over him, you'll see it everywhere because people are so excited to get highlights over him. Victor's that same way. It doesn't matter really who wins this Defensive Player of the Year award. While I think it should be Victor, we'll never know what happens. At the very least, he's locked up Rookie of the Year, and he'll definitely be all-defensive first team. It doesn't matter, though, for the third time. The Spurs need to get him help, and they need to get it quickly. No one expected Wembenyama to come in the league and dominate so early. We knew he had that alien-like all-star unheard of potential but for him to come in in his rookie season and start doing it from the get-go I mean come on now how there's never been a player maybe outside of Michael Jordan or LeBron where in their rookie season you just knew like this like we have a big window starting now and we got to get players around him Michael averaged 28 in his rookie season Victor averaged 21 we've seen that before and now it's time for the Spurs to make some moves. This roster outside of Vic, Jeremy Sohan, and Devin Vassell, that's it. That's it. You have those three cornerstone pieces, and there's a, there's maybe one or two guys who I think stay. I mean, I, I would love to see maybe Trey Jones stay, but he's not someone who's going to be a star point guard at the helm of a playoff team. While Trey Jones is an efficient ball handler, a good floor general, he doesn't have that elite scorer's mentality. He isn't someone who can create space off the dribble. or and, and, I mean, he's been struggling to shoot the three ball throughout the course of his career. That's something that finally stepped up. Maybe Blake Wesley, um, the other fellow Frenchman, uh, C.D. Sissoko. I know there's probably a handful of names that you guys are like, who are you talking about? But this is what I know. There's, a hand, there's maybe five or six players on this roster who stay coming into next season if I'm the general manager. Because when I know Victor Wembanyama's potential, this guy might get the largest contract extension in NBA history. So while he's on his rookie deal, why do we not take advantage of that knowing the talent that we have? I mean, this guy could arguably be a top 10 player next season. He may be a top 15 player this season. You never know. That's, but that's how good this kid was in his rookie season. And taking talent like that, it doesn't come by often. When I look at, this is just a comparison, but when I look at what like the Houston Texans did, they, they drafted CJ Stroud with number two, and the kid was in MVP talks. And then they go and sign Daniel Hunter. They trade for Stephon Diggs. They make moves like that while knowing they have CJ Stroud for cheap because they're gonna eventually have to extend him and it's gonna be a large deal. That's what the Spurs need to do. They need to put the best talent around him while his contract is cheap before it gets expensive so they can capitalize and see if they can maybe make a few playoff runs and put themselves into championship contention. I mean, this roster is not built to compete. Julian Champagny started the majority of the season. You probably have never heard of that guy. He's solid. 
He's a great three-point shooter when he's consistent. But they need to upgrade this roster. Victor needs a running mate. And with that window, dom- when the window of his dominance is significantly larger than expected, and the Spurs are going to have $34.4 million in cap space to spend. And let's not forget, they have a huge haul of draft compensation. They have, I think, 20 first-round picks until 2030, and then 27 second-round picks. It's something insane like that. They have a ton of draft capital. Let's not forget, in 2021, or 2022, it was, DeJounte Murray was traded to the Atlanta Hawks, and Atlanta gave up a haul. They gave up two unprotected first-round picks and the right to swap picks in 2026. Essentially, three first-round picks. And now Atlanta's forced to rebuild because they've been mediocre outside of their Eastern Conference Finals run in 2021, but they haven't done anything since. And their target that the Spurs need to get also comes out for Atlanta. Not DeJounte Murray again, but the Oklahoma Sooner, Trey Young. Young has already expressed his desire to play with Wimbenyama. There's been reports that his camp is excitedly open to the pairing of the two, and the two teams discuss the deal at the trade deadline, which is inspiring. To me, that is amazing because to see that there's actually some motion in this in this rumor and not just rumors, that makes me think that there's potentially chances that this could be a possibility coming into the summer. And reports just came out, I mean, literally just came out about an hour, hour and a half ago, that said many executives think that Trey Young's going to be moved as long as there's a buyer. The buyer is the Spurs. The Spurs are that buyer. The, S- the Spurs also need an elite point guard who can thrive in the pick and roll, can score at an elite level, create shots, and throw the lob. That's what Trey Young is. He is known for being a pick and roll heavy guard who can get his big lobs. He played with Clint Capella and John Collins for the majority of his career so far. And look at what he did with them. He made John Collins look like a uh, viable player. And he got a big extension too, I think, before they traded him to Utah. Just imagine what he's going to do with seven foot five Victor Wimbenyama. He's everything they're missing. Game-changing point guard who is shifty with the ball and can score in elite ways. And he also has experience with stepping up down the stretch and in big moments. He's had amazing big moments. I mean, remember the playoff series in 2021 where he made New York his son? The Spurs don't have really any veteran leadership on the roster outside of Devontae Graham, who hit like the one game winner for them this season. But that's it. They need someone who can be elite scorer and lead down the stretch and mentor other guys. Ever since their conference run in 2021, like I said, they haven't found any success, and they only reached the postseason once since trading for DeJounte Murray, and that was in 2023, last season, and then they were eliminated by the Boston Celtics, I think, in five. They've been mediocre since the Murray acquisition, and Trey also missed the back half of this season with a torn ligament in his left pinky. They're sitting at 36 and 46, and they their play-in game is on Wednesday against the Chicago Bulls. I think obviously that record isn't what it is without Trey Young missing the season, half of the season, because when you're missing your star point guard, you're obviously not going to be as good. But this pairing has not worked. Unlike the Luka Doncic and Kyrie Irving pair that I talked about earlier, these two have not been able to coexist. Both are guys who need the ball in their hands to be dominant. I remember that one season where DeJounte Murray elevated his trade value He averaged nearly a triple-double because he was getting an all-time usage. And ever since Young got out, DeJounte has returned to that form. But Murray is not a guy who can play alongside another guard. He could definitely play alongside a big at the very least. That's for dang sure. But whenever someone else needs the ball in their hands to be good, Murray's not going to get that usage. And we've seen how he has stepped up since Trey Young's injury and now when the two are back together again it's do or die at this point you lose on Wednesday you go home and then you start thinking about the offseason or you set yourselves up for a date with the Boston Celtics who are probably the best team in the league 
I mean, pick your poison. Yes, it's going to feel good that you'll make the playoffs, but you also lose out on a lottery pick, and you'll probably be gone in four. So make your choice, Atlanta. What do you want to do? Do you want to get a high lottery pick because you actually own that pick and trade Trey Young, start looking to the future to rebuild because there hasn't been any success since their Eastern Conference Finals run? The Spurs have all the leverage on a potential deal for Trey Young. They do. They have all the leverage. With the with the haul of picks that they've had, Atlanta's forced to rebuild. There's not really anything else they can get. With the Spurs owning all their picks, if they decide, hey, we're going to move on from Trey Young, Brian Wright picks up the phone and says, hey, give us Trey Young. We'll give you your picks back. Bingo. Just like that. Now, there are a lot of rumors that Trey Young could potentially find his way to the Lakers. But how? I get it. Everyone wants to go to the shining lights of the Los Angeles Lakers, play with LeBron James and Anthony Davis. And to be fair, Trey Young would really f- fit in like a puzzle piece with those two because they haven't had elite point guard play in Lord knows how long. They won their one championship in 2020, and then they tried to get the Russell Westbrook thing to work, which it didn't. They tried to get the D'Angelo Russell thing to work. And that last season when they acquired him at the deadline, it was, eh. But this season, D'Lo's been on another level. He's been an elite shooter. He's been consistent. He's been a, a step up than what he was shades of in his former time with the Lakers, with the Golden State Warriors, with the Timberwolves. He really stepped up his play whenever he got to L.A., and that was good because he was on the trading block. There was a lot of rumors that D'Lo was going to be on the move, but he proved him wrong and saved his contract, and I don't know how long that's going to last, though. I don't. The Lakers could offer a substantial package of something like D'Lo, Austin Reeves, Rui Hachimura, but you, but that at the end of the day, the Lakers don't have nearly as much draft capital as the Spurs do. Atlanta owns, or the, the Spurs own all of Atlanta's draft capital. So if I'm Atlanta, why would I not want to get that back? Because when you send Young to Atlanta or to Los Angeles, you pair up Young with Anthony Davis. I'm not mentioning LeBron James because we don't know how much time he has left in this league. It's seeming pretty likely that, who knows, he could retire in the next two years. So you're going to pair two elite players together and then form whatever else you can around them. Yes, they'll have to give up a lot, but (laughs) it's 50-50. Do you want to take more players or do you want to take more draft capital for the future? If they want more draft capital, which it's reported they do, then they need to look at San Antonio because that's who has their draft capital for the next three years. Cooper Flag is probably going to come out of the 2025 NBA draft, and the Spurs own that pick unprotected. What else do you do? What else? But if the Spurs decide that they don't want to move on from and, and acquire Young, then they still have all this draft capital. If they don't work something together, that's going to be fine. Spurs will probably land somewhere around the top four this season, and... My favorite player is Rob Dillingham out of Kentucky. There's no question about it. He reminds me a lot of John Morant, and he he just he's elite. He's explosive. He's a space creator. He's a scorer. He can walk into any bucket and make it with ease. He's that type of player. He's that type of point guard. The Spurs need their Kentucky point guard. There's all those jokes about, hey, some of the best point guards come out of Kentucky, and they do. We know what John Calipari is known for, and now obviously at Arkansas, it's exciting. But when you look at some of his alumni, Shea Gilders-Alexander, MVP candidate, Jamal Murray, significant point guard on the championship team. Uh, Tyler Hero has played significant parts for Miami, and they've made the finals in in recent memory two times in the last five years. Um, I mean, Keldon Johnson, I know he's not a point guard, but Keldon Johnson, Kentucky Kentucky guard. De'Aaron Fox, Bam Adebayo. There's so many guys for Kentucky who have translated to the NBA. And if the Spurs don't want to give up on all their draft assets, then Rob Dillingham is the guy to go after in this year's draft. And also, 
The Spurs have Toronto's first round pick from 20 for, for this season. A few years ago, they traded away Yaka Pirtle and they got a first round pick in return, which is going to be top six protected. So that's a big deal. Toronto really, really had a downward trend towards the end of the season because Scotty Barnes got hurt and he was out indefinitely. So guys like RJ Barrett, uh, uh, Emmanuel Quickly, um, those were the two guys who really had to step up their play, and they didn't. They really did, they, they didn't. I think, so Toronto finished at 12th in the Eastern Conference, and they are 25 and 57. Puts them above Charlotte, Washington, the Pistons in the East, and in the West, it puts them above San Antonio and the Trailblazers. Memphis sits right above them at 27 and 55. So there's a high likelihood that their pick lands outside the top five. As long as it lands at seven or below, the Spurs will get that pick, and they need to add a wing. There is no wing presence on this roster. Julian Champagne and Keldon Johnson. While Keldon Johnson has is kind of a streaky scorer from time to time, he's not a consistent decision maker. He's not a consistent scorer. Pop literally benched him because he was struggling to be consistent. One of my favorite wings, if not my favorite wing in this draft, is Matas Bazelis from the G League Ignite. It's a very wing-heavy draft class. You got Zachary Richashar, uh, uh Ron Holland, Buzelis, Cody Williams. I know he's listed as a shooting guard, but he is a 6'8 a guy, so he could play that combo uh, shooting guard, small forward prototype. The Spurs really need to upgrade the point guard and their wings desperately and a backup center. There's so many pl- pieces that this roster is desperately missing and really needs to add if they want to be competitive in the early stages of the Wembenyama era. You have to you have to capitalize on talent such as this. You do. You really have to capitalize on a talent like Wembenyama and they've yet to do that. I get it. It's his rookie season. You weren't expecting him to be as good, but now it's time to make some moves and get themselves back into the playoffs, as that's what the Spurs are known for. There's no, they're known for being in the playoffs every year, for being an amazing regular season team, and making deep runs. Five championships, that's what they're known for. The playoffs. Playoffs? We talking playoffs? That's what we're doing. We're talking playoffs here. It is going to be a very, very fun playoffs this year. I really like this. We're going to go through some predictions because that's what I like to do. That's what I that's what I'm that's what I'm known for. Predictions. We're going to start off in the play in because on both sides of each conference, this play in tournament is insane. Starting with the 7 and 8 game, we got the Lakers and the Pelicans. I'm definitely taking the Lakers in this one only because LeBron James is inevitable. We know what he's known for. Stepping up when the moment is at its biggest. He'll step up, and then they will face Denver in the second round. The Pelicans will fall to the second round of the play-in. And then Kings versus Warriors. This one's fun. I didn't, like, we got Steph Curry and the Warriors versus De'Aaron Fox and the Kings. One of these teams is going home. Both of these teams are 46 and 36. And if you lose, it's over. That's how insanely tight the Western Conference was this season. It's going to be in Sacktown. I got the Kings. I think this could be one of those games where maybe Steph Curry goes for 50 and proves me wrong. But I think Sacramento is going to be able to utilize their crowd. That's what they're known for, for having one of the louder crowds. Light the beam. One of the best fan cultures in the league. It'll be loud in Golden 1 Center. And I think Sacramento will take that, setting up a matchup with the Pelicans. But it's not lasting long, Sacramento. You're going home. This Pelicans team is too athletic. They've been struggling all season with injuries. Brandon Ingram's been out the majority of the season. Zion Williamson actually stayed healthy. Jose Alvarado, I know, was out significant time. This is a team who has been really consistent all season, sitting around four through six seed, and they just fell to seven because of how tight this Western Conference was. And so the Pelicans are going to set up a matchup with the Oklahoma City Thunder. Looking at this Western Conference, anyone could come out of it. I mean, the Suns, who are the sixth seed, are are 49 and 33. Pelicans, who are the seventh seed, are also 49 and 33. They'll be the eighth seed. 
I mean, who could not win this Western Conference realistically? Well, now, looking at the East, this is this is also another fun one. Sixers versus Heat. Joel Embiid is back, and that's the only reason they were in the seventh seed. Tyrese Maxey has stepped up his play since Embiid has been out, and now Embiid's back, and it's time to right the ship. The Sixers will take down the Heat in game one of the play in securing the seventh seed and a matchup with the New York Knicks, who now sit at the two seed. That is a really, really fun first round. The Knicks are finally starting to put it together. Uh, Julius Randle has been out the majority of the season. Uh, OG Ananobi, when he plays, he plays some of the most glue guy basketball you'll ever see. And that's what the Knicks were missing. Everyone thought they were insane to give up RJ Barrett and Emmanuel quickly and a pick for OG Ananobi. I thought it was an overpay myself, but it's worked. It's worked and it's worked well. Now, the Hawks and the Bulls, I mean, two teams who have just been completely mediocre. And I know I mentioned Trey Young has been out the majority of the season, but Chicago has always been mediocre too. I think the Hawks will step up and they'll take down the Bulls in the first round, sending Chicago home. And it's time for them to hit the rebuild button as well. Now, in the last matchup of this play in, we got Miami versus Atlanta. Give me Jimmy. Give me Jimmy in the heat. They've been here too many times before. Jimmy knows how to step up when the moment is, is bright. And they just match up better. Tyler Hero is back from injury. Terry Rogier has been playing well. Jimmy Butler steps up, as I said. Bam out of bio. I mean, and we all know the jokes about how undrafted players or, or older veterans get voodoo magic when they enter Miami Jersey. Look for their veterans to step up. Kevin Love's still on the team. They just got Patty Mills. Those are guys who are experienced, who know how to play winner go home basketball, and that's what's going to be the key in Miami clenching the eighth seed in a rematch with the Boston Celtics, who they've who they beat last year in seven, and then they lost in seven in twenty twenty two, yeah, in twenty twenty two, the trilogy of Miami and Boston. Now let's get to it. Let's kind of start kind of going a little fast through these because there's a lot to talk about. And if I don't move through it, we'll be here a long time. We'll start with the East just because that's where we were. Boston versus Miami in round one. I'll take the Celtics in five because this is the most well-rounded team in basketball. Drew Holiday, Derek White, Jalen Brown, Jason Tatum, Chris Asperzingas, um, Al Horford, even Peyton Pritchard has been playing good as of lately. This team is just too stacked. It's a super team. It, it is a super team. And I am taking them, and they they will go far. Just, just a warning. They will go far. Four versus five. We've got the Cavs versus the Magic. The Magic have been one of my favorite teams to watch this season, and I will be rooting for them and the Knicks in the Eastern Conference, and I'll be rooting for the Mavericks just Mavericks and the Timberwolves in the Western Conference. Those are two teams who I've always been keeping my eyes on. I really want to see the Magic win this series, but it's not going to happen. Garland, Mitchell, Evan Mobley, Jared Allen, Max Struess, I mean... The Cavs are just, they're very well-rounded. Star talent is everywhere on this roster, and I think at the end of the day, the Magic are young, and but now is just not their time. Their time will come soon, but it's going to be interesting, though. The Magic have played really great defense all season, one of the best hustle teams in the NBA. I'll take the Cavs in seven. I think Orlando's going to be hyped to be there. I think Paolo Bencaro is ready to step it up, and I think the defensive intensity that they've, lived with that culture all season. I think that is going to be elevated, but I just there's too much firepower on this Cavaliers team, and I'm going to take the Cavs in seven. Now, this is a get-your-popcorn-out series between Milwaukee and Indiana. Tyrese Halliburton has kind of emerged to stardom. One of the sleeper teams all season that I had going into the season, and now they're here in the playoffs. It's going to set up a fun matchup. And we all know the history between these two teams. That's been going on throughout the course of the year. Uh, Giannis dropped 64 points, and supposedly the game ball was stolen, which led to just ruckus all over the floor. He literally ran back into the opposing locker room and is probably trying to fight people. But I have the Bucks. 
I'm going to have the Bucks in six. I think Giannis's dominance is too much, but it's going to be interesting, though, because supposedly he's going to miss out on maybe one or two games of the opener series. So look to see Indiana capitalize on that. Maybe they steal one or one game in Milwaukee. Maybe they steal two games if Giannis sits out because Dame Lillard has been struggling this season. We know what he's built for. But he's been struggling, and he's going to have to step up his play, especially if Giannis is going to be out. And I'm looking for Chris Dame, Chris Middleton, Bobby Portis, Brooke Lopez. Those are guys who are really going to have to elevate their play to avoid digging a hole, and that Giannis is going to have to come in maybe too quickly, and he's not going to be the same player. But Bucks in six. Looking at the bottom matchup, we have the Knicks versus the 76ers. I want New York here so bad, but I got to take the 76ers. I do. It's going to be a seven-game series, and it's going to come down to Joel Embiid just being back. We know that seven seed is not true. We know that with Joel Embiid, they're probably a top three seed in the Eastern Conference. So, I mean, this is really more so a Eastern Conference Finals matchup rather than a a first round matchup. And I really like Tyrese Maxey. He was one of my favorite players in the league. And I knew as soon as James Harden was traded, I said, Tyrese Maxey is someone who's going to be an all-star caliber player whenever James Harden is on the move. And that's what he was. He had a 50 point performance against the Spurs a few weeks ago. And he's a guy who can just put it in sixth gear and not look back. Joel Embiid, he plays not my favorite style of basketball. I'll be honest. I don't like watching Joel Embiid play, but it works, and I think at the end of the day, when you got Joel Embiid and you have Tyrese Maxey, two guys who are playing stellar basketball when they were together, and Tyrese Maxey stepped up when Joel Embiid tore his meniscus, and then you have uh, Tobias Harris, who can stretch the floor and shoot the three ball. Those are three guys who I'm really looking for to kind of step up their game and see how much they're going to be able to conquer this New York team because Jalen Brunson... He's amazing. Julius Randle has really struggled in the playoffs, but we'll see. Let's not forget, they also had a Buddy Heald at the trade deadline, Kyle Lowry at the trade deadline after a buyout market with, uh, acquisition with the Charlotte Hornets. Kelly Oubre Jr., one of the most underrated signings in last year's free agency. Pro hog Ricky Council IV, who has been playing exceptional since his uh, – emergence into the lineup. They got Mobama backup center, Nick Batum, older guy, but knows how to shoot the three ball. He's a consistent streaky shooter. I just like, I like Philadelphia more in this scenario than I like New York. While I think New York has maybe a little more star power, maybe not. That's maybe be one of my most terrible takes I think I've ever takes I've ever said. And when I look at this matchup, it's just whose stars are going to step up in a bigger way. Is Jalen Brunson going to step up an average 40? Is, is Joel Embiid going to play MVP-type basketball that we're used to? Is Julius Randle going to fade in the playoffs like we're used to him seeing? Who knows? Who knows? But it's going to be a very fun series. I think we'll go to seven, but I am going to take the Philadelphia 76ers over the New York Knicks in seven games. Now, let's try and start speeding through the West a little bit. Thunder versus the Pelicans. This is a fun one. I think it'll be Thunder in seven. I just don't know how they're going to be able to contain Zion Williamson and Jonas Valanciunas because Chet Holmgren hasn't been a guy who's been able to physically match up well with bigger, more athletic, physical centers. We saw what Anthony Davis did to him. Jo Jonas Valanciunas is a very physical back-to-the-basket center, very big, very heavy, and I think Chet is going to struggle with that, but... Shea's ready to step up. He's had playoff experience before in the bubble with Chris Paul, and he's had big moments. That's what Shea's known for. There's a reason he's in the MVP race, and he's a guy that they can rely on down the stretch. I'm looking for Jalen Williams out of USC to be a very crucial factor, especially defending Zion Williamson, because that's the guy that you're going to have to worry about the most. I think this is the Pelicans' first playoff series with Zion. Because I know they made it a few years ago, but Zion was injured, and they played the Clippers in the first round, something like that. That's what it was. But give me the Thunder in seven. I think Shea and McCollum are going to be a fun back-and-forth battle to watch. But Shea is the type of guy, when the moment is 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 there, 
he's going to step up and he could drop 40, 45, somewhere around that range. I'd even, I wouldn't be shocked if he dropped his first 50 piece of the season. Clippers versus Mavericks. We all know what I was talking about earlier with Luka Doncic and give me the Luka Doncic and Kyrie Irving show. James Harden is a notorious playoff choker. Paul George had that one choking season in the bubble, but he stepped up before and he led that team to a Western Conference Finals to eventually be eliminated by Phoenix. But there's too much ball to go around on this Clippers team. I know they got it going a little bit after the Harden trade, but I think Luka Doncic, obviously we mentioned earlier, it's personal once he plays the Clippers. So I think he's going to step up and, and show why he is the MVP. Give me Mavericks in six. Timberwolves versus Suns. This is a fun one. We all know the Anthony Edwards uh, meme where he's like, hey, they got Kevin Durant, but we got Jaden McDaniels. This is going to be a very defensive-minded series for the Timberwolves. That's what's going to have to be the factor in the Timberwolves winning this series, and I think they will. This is a very well-rounded team, arguably the best. Mike Conley has come in and brought a winning mentality to this locker room, which is what they needed. They didn't need as much young talent. You have your superstar in Anthony Edwards. You have your second star in Carl Anthony Towns. Then they get Mike Conley and Rudy Gobert through trades. While they gave up so much to get Gobert, it's proven to be worth it. And then the Mike Conley trade kind of put a question mark on everyone's minds. Like, what is Minnesota doing? Mike Conley isn't nearly as valuable anymore, but he is. He is a game-managing point guard who has been in big moments before, and we know that Memphis Grizzlies team with him and Mark Gasol. He is a guy they, they're going to look to down the stretch alongside Anthony Edwards and Cap. Because when you have someone who is so much experienced under his belt, I think he's like 37 or something like that, that's someone you want on your roster. And that's why the Timberwolves have been so good this season because of Mike Conley's contributions on the floor and in the locker room, providing and bringing a winning culture to a Memphis or a Minnesota Timberwolves team that really hadn't developed that yet. Give me the Timberwolves in seven. I know I'm saying a lot of seven-game series, but I think this is going to be one of those game, those series where you got, I mean, you got Kevin Durant, Devin Booker, Bradley Beal, Grayson Allen just got an extension, Yusuf Nurkic. This is going to be a very fun series. By the end of the day, it's going to come down to who has the better defense, and the Timberwolves do. Now, looking at Denver versus the Lakers, Denver's going to do what they did last season. In the Western Conference Finals, Nikola Jokic just turned into a unicorn, an unspecimen, something that just was just completely dominant. You play 23.9 seconds of perfect defense, and Jokic throws up the most morale-crushing, just fall away, just chucks it up, and it goes in. It's not gonna. Be, I don't think it'll be as dominant. I think the Nuggets will win it in six, but Denver knows how to handle the Lakers. Denver is Los Angeles's kryptonite. LeBron and AD will go home packing in six games. I got Denver to beat them in six. Now let's start getting the West. The second uh, second round. We'll stay in the West. Mavericks versus Thunder. Give me the Mavericks in seven. I think they match up so much better. I think this is going to be a, a, a series where you see the 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 Luka Doncic versus Shea Gilgis Alexander show. At the end of the day, I think it's going to be Luka Doncic. He has more experience in playoff moments. He led the team to a Western Conference Finals run when Spencer Dinwiddie was his second best player. And then, as I said earlier, I'm looking at the Chet Holmgren matchup. He, I do not see him matching up well with Daniel Gafford and Derek Lively. P.J. Washington is going to have to step up as well. Space the floor, shoot the three-pointer consistently. Watch out for Lou Dort. Lou Dort is a very, very, very good perimeter defender, and I assume he'll have the Luka Doncic matchup all series, but I'm taking Dallas in seven over Oklahoma City. Now we have Denver versus Minnesota, and I'm taking Denver once again. The Gobert and Jokic matchup will be fun. But at the end of the day, I'm looking at the team who has more experience. And that's what that's what it comes down to in the playoffs. Experience builds culture. Sometimes you have to lose a playoff series or two before you make your deep run. That's what Denver did. They had a couple two seeds, couple one seeds, couple three seeds, somewhere around there before they were able to put it all together and make a finals run. That's fine. Perfectly fine. 
to get years of experience under your belt and learn what they need to do because while Minnesota has the best defense, you just can't stop Nicole Jokic. So now we have a Western Conference Finals matchup of Dallas versus Denver. Now let's go to the second round of the Eastern Conference, Boston versus the Cavs. Give me the Celtics in five. I think just the Celtics are going to be dominant. They are. There's no other way to put it together. They're just going to be a dominant force to be reckoned with. Bucks versus the 76ers. Yeah. You didn't think I was going to pick the Bucks, did you? I will. Give me Bucks in six. Giannis Antetokounmpo is going to be very physical. And once again, kind of the same situation as Denver. More experience. Philly hasn't made it past the second round since Allen Iverson was there. And it's not going to happen again. Give me the Bucks in six over the Philadelphia 76ers. Now, the conference championship series. Denver versus Dallas and Boston versus Milwaukee. In the Western Conference, I'm going to take, once again, the Dallas Mavericks. My MVP in Luka Doncic is going to show why he, he is the MVP and why Dallas is completely going to run through the Western Conference. I'm going to take the Mavericks in seven. This is going to be an amazing matchup. Whenever Luka Doncic and Jokic go, again, go head-to-head, it's in for some all-time battles. It really is. I love the Dallas Mavericks. I do. They're one of my favorite teams to watch, and I think Luka Doncic is going to finally break that stretch of not making it to the finals, and he's going to get there this time. With the best team around him in his entire career, he's going to be ready to take that team to the finals. And when I look now at the Eastern Conference in Boston versus Milwaukee, I'm taking Boston. It's also going to be in seven. This is going to be one of the most fun, energetic, competitive playoff whole entire playoffs that we've had in so long. There are so many series that could go to seven, and that's what that's going to be this year. I think there's going to be a lot of games, a lot of series that are going down to the wire, and you're going to see some of the most energetic and competitive basketball you've seen in quite some time because both conferences are amazing. I can't remember the last time both conferences were this tightly uh, uh, seated. But you're going to see it, and it's going to show in the playoffs that every team is capable of making a deep run. But in the NBA Finals, I have Dallas versus Boston. I didn't think I would be saying this. I've never been a believer of this team. But I think Boston's going to get it done in six. I think Boston's going to win their first championship since the Kevin Garnett, Paul Pierce days because you have two amazing defenders in Drew Holiday and Derek White in the backcourt. Two amazing forwards in Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum. While Tatum has struggled in some postseason runs, especially that one finals appearance versus the Warriors, I think he has so much help around him now that there is less pressure, and he's going to play with less pressure, and it's going to show. Sometimes players fold under the spotlight, fold under the pressure, and I think Tatum did that in his first appearance, but now he has so much help. I forgot Christoph Porzingis is there too. I mean, there's just so many, so much all-star talent, role, great role players. They made great moves at the deadline by acquiring uh, Xavier Tillman as well. I mean, Peyton Pritchard, Jordan Walsh, Pro Hog, shout out to him. This 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 Celtics team, I think they're too good to lose. They're too good to lose the finals. They're too good to lose in the playoffs. They're too well-rounded. There, there's no flaws in this game. You want interior presence, you got Al Horford and Chris Porzingis. You want perimeter defense, you have Drew Holiday and Derek White. You want scoring, you have half this team can score the rock efficiently. And that's going to take the Boston Celtics to the finals. That's it for me. That's it. That's who I have as my champion. So thank you guys so much for listening to this. If you're watching this on YouTube, hit that subscribe button. And I'm once again, thank you guys so much for just enjoying, letting letting me come out and display my talents and my passion. So hopefully, hopefully this won't be the last time you guys hear from me. So thank you guys so much for listening. I am Ty Talk Sports, and until next time, I will see you guys.